Greetings YouTube. Today I'm going to review the book The Seven Wonders of the Ancient World, edited by Peter Clayton and Martin Price. Now this is edited by these two men because this is essentially overlong research papers, maybe extensive essays you want to call them, but they're by different authors and each deals with one particular um, of the Seven Wonders and the Seven Wonders listed in the book in order are uh, the Great Pyramid of Giza, just the Great Pyramid, the, not the entire pyramid complex itself, but the, the, the largest of them. Um, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Statue of Zeus at Olympia, the Temple of Artemis at Euphosis, or Euphasis, Phasis? Phasis. Um, the Mausoleum at um, Helicarnassus, the, Col the Colossus of Rhodes, the Pharos of, at Alexandria. And then there is a um, epilogue, Forgotten Wonders, dealing with some less well-known wonders. Um, and there's a selected bibliography and an index. Now, the most famous one, and the only one that still survives, is the Pyramid at Giza. Um, obviously, this isn't a very big book. This, and it's only, a, like I said, a, a, a long essay um, on the topic. Um, because, let's face it, you could fill my entire personal library with books on the pyramids. Uh, not just scholarly texts, but the f more fringe material that has often been associated with that particular, um, those particular structures. Fascinating as they are, um, that particular essay was a little light. I don't think it covered any ground that I haven't ever haven't seen before, just in documentaries I've watched. So while it was nice to see it, and particularly maybe to see it from the perspective of those in the ancient world, um, it wasn't particularly interesting. I found the other essays far more interesting. Now what I thought was kind of cool is that there was only a 50 year time span when you could have visited all seven of the seven wonders of the ancient world. After that, or before that, they either hadn't been built or they had already started to fall, fall apart or be demolished and used by other people for other things. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, then we have the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, and these are not. This this is a big if. No one's even sure if these were ever made. Um, but if they were made, they were in a particular city, and the city itself had huge. Babylon had huge walls. I mean, the walls themselves probably rank as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world because they were just very high, very wide. Legend says that you could ride a chariot along the top of the walls. That's a big wall. Um, but if they did exist, they had been built as a gift to a king's mistress or wife. Legends differ who it was. Because she came from a, a mountainous reason, region, and there are no mountains in Babylon. Um, so she wanted to see the trees and the valleys that from her from her homeland. So he built these terraced gardens that would then could be then be planted so there would be sections of lawn with trees and things and there has been some kind of complicated um, hydraulic system to you know water all this stuff so that it would give the illusion of there being a mountainside with plants on it. It's kind of a cool idea. Doable with the, with the technology at the time, but a monumental task. Uh, then we have the statue of Zeus at Olympia. These these three, I actually known these. A couple of these I didn't know, but these three I knew about these. And the statue of Zeus uh, at Olympia was this immense statue made of gold and ivory, of a seated Zeus holding a a, uh, a figure in his hand, staff in the other, and it was it was a place of worship. I mean, it was just an immense figure. I mean, the figure in his hand was like life-size. It was a very big statue. Um, very impressive. Um, of course, eventually demolished um, and the parts taken for other things, as almost all of these things are. I mean, look at the outside of the pyramids. They were stripped for um, their, their stone casing. Only a very small section of the top still has it. any of its stone casing left at all. Um, then we have the Temple of Artemis at um, E-P-H-E-S-O-S. -E it's, it's Greek, so it's e Phasis? Phosis? I don't know. Um, this one I actually didn't know about. This was a famous statue of Artemis that had uh, been the center figure in a large altar, a large temple, and very well known for both its quality and its size, um, which was kind of cool. And the 
uh, they they actually dwell on the whole evolution of that site, which I thought was kind of cool because the way the altars were changed over time, well, the way the altars were altered over time. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting because you could actually see the progress through the archaeological discoveries. Um, then we have the mausoleum at Halicarnassus. Now, the mausoleum was built for Mausolosos, which is a single person. So mausoleum meant a building dedicated to one guy, even though that is now a generic term in our world. At one time in the past, it meant a building dedicated to a person. That kind of language evolution and change fascinates me. Um, then we have the Colossus of Rhodes, and this was a huge bronze statue. Probably It was probably slightly less, uh, not as quite as tall as the um, Statue of Liberty in New York, but still very impressive because it was done at a much earlier time. And it was probably a very uh, vertical figure, legs together, arms together, uh, holding a torch high with a spear running out along the body on the other side. Done vertical because it would have been it would have been cast and then earth would have packed around it to get to the next level, another section cast. So it was like cast in place in sections and then all the dirt was taken off of it to reveal the statue itself. Um, then we have the Pharos at Alexandria and the Pharos was the first true lighthouse, this huge building with a, um, a large fire built inside of it and then reflecting mirrors and, and lenses that amplified this. So the fire itself was impressive, but not the only light source, because there just simply was no way to have a, f a light source that bright that was just a fire. There wasn't enough fuel to, to provide in, in the area to, to do that. But with this impressive fire nonetheless, they could then use lenses and reflectors to create a very bright light, and it could be seen for, you know, 35, 40 miles from, from shore to prevent shipwrecks. And this, the word pharos, has been used and still in use to designate a lighthouse. So I really enjoyed this book. I thought it was quite um, entertaining. It's a little dry in spots. So again, on this stuff, I definitely had the feeling of essays or, or research papers, not really being written for the general populace, um, but being written for other researchers and other scientists. Um, so if you, you don't mind a slightly dry text, this is definitely worth a read. I'm going to be keeping this book because it has some really excellent engravings and photographs in there. That alone was worth the 50 cents I paid for it at a yard sale. So, you know, very cool. So, if you enjoy history and would like an overview of the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World, this book has got everything in it that you're going to need.